Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Coin Republic podcast. My name is Shora Bacharya. The talk of the town today, crypto mining. Okay, it never ceases to excite us. Uh, it's ever changing. Uh, but today, though, we need to educate ourselves better on this topic. And I think this particular broadcast is going to be quite resourceful to you because uh, I have with myself, Mr. Joe Downey, the CMO of NiceHash. Uh, now, NiceHash have been uh, on business since 2014, and they have done nothing but exceptional work uh, from that time onwards. Uh, let's discuss about their venture. What do they bring to the table and how it's different from everybody else in the market, as well as let's trying to address certain traditional or certain non-traditional questions regarding crypto mining. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon the screen, Mr. Joe Downey. Welcome to the Hi. show, sir. Thanks for having me here. Great to be here. And looking forward to the, uh, to the show today as well. So let, right, right off the bat, let me ask you about the, you know, the, the, the pandemic economy and how it's affecting your business in particular? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic has affected the, the whole world as we've seen. I don't think there's many businesses that can say they weren't uh, affected by it. Mm. But in the case of uh, crypto mining and mining in general, we've actually seen quite um, a boost in the interest, um, especially over the last year. This is for many reasons, but uh, it's, it's one of the industries that's peaked a lot People have really started to look for alternative sources of income and mining or cryptocurrencies is a great way to, to do that. Fair enough. But, you know, let's let's address the elephant in the room here since we're talking about mining. Right, so someone who wants to start uh, mining uh, has to put energy consumption at the very top of their budget. Do you think uh, we are moving towards an energy-friendly mining approach in the future? Uh, you know, as we witnessed in the past, people went from CPU to GPU to now ASIC or maybe hybrid rigs. W what's the future like? That was a very hot uh, question at the moment. Lots of people are talking about energy and, and especially with energy of mining. Um, I think before answering that, it's important to understand the, the reasons why a coin like Bitcoin and other currencies, why they actually use energy uh, in the first place. And block, for blockchain projects to be successful, they need to be secure. And for this, they need to be decentralized. And so the more people who are mining, the more secure the network is. And the hash rate is higher, the more secure it is. So with a coin like Bitcoin, where it's much, much higher hash rate and much, much more secure than most uh, other coins, the energy factor is not something that's very easy to remove from it. So in this case, it's more a question of looking for environmentally friendly ways to, mm -hmm. to mine rather than for the um, taking out the energy from the equation. True that, true that energy cannot, uh, it, it, it's always going to be there. But again, you know, the companies like you are bringing so like it's fresh approaches every time. And that's something that we're looking forward to. Uh, but, you know, let, let's talk about something specific to your brand, right? Uh, we, we saw this in your website as well, a, a disclaimer. Uh, you warn, well, you disclaim about a third pi a party plugins and miners, and you say, uh, you, you, you suggest people to, uh, to use quick mine, nice hash quick miner. How is it different? So quick miner is really a part of the larger goals of nice hash, which is to make mining easy and safe for everyone. It's very, it's very difficult to encourage new talents into um, an industry, especially a new technology, if it's not uh, simple and easy for people to use. And QuickMiner is an innovative approach in that we made sure that the code was 100% accountable for. So it's written mostly by our team, and it's uh, been through a very, very rigorous process of verification. And it's actually one of the first miners to have I believe it's actually still the only miner that has an EV certificate. Wow. So it's a very good indication that the code is good and it's secure. Whereas a NiceHash miner was compiled together with many third-party miners. Uh, and this is, is uh, great for algorithm switching. So you can easily 
switch um, algorithms, but we don't have any control over the developers of the software. Mm -hmm. So if there's some problem further down the line and we, we don't know who these people are, it becomes very difficult for, for us to, to analyze the problem. And in this case, you know, NiceHash would get the blame. Let's face it. I mean, we, we provide the software to millions of people and something goes wrong, that's on us. So QuickMiner is a way to address this. And to, our mission is to make the mining scene safer and easier for everyone. It's, it's really, uh, you know, interesting that you do take responsibility. I mean, we also witnessed an exciting story in 2017. Uh, you, you, you were hacked by a couple of guys from North Korea, if I reckon. You, you paid off the loss to the consumers from your profit later. And now that's a commitment, I must say, you know. But now, now these days, uh, I, I think a couple of days ago, these guys were caught, Right. Uh, what experience have you gained from all of this and how did you approach the security point of view from that point onwards? You know, first of all, I'd like to point out that it's, uh, it was actually the Lazarus group. So the, the guys that were uh, indicted from this, they were part of the Lazarus group, which is one of the most okay. notorious yeah, Lazarus, uh, yeah. criminal groups out there, as we, as we know. Yeah. And the, the guys that were... Um, indicted for this, they were linked to a number of other uh, exchange hacks, uh, one in New York, one in Indonesia, and mm. several others. Um, but after the hack, I mean, NiceHash went through a very difficult time. We had some, some big de uh, decisions and choices to make. Uh, when something like that happens, it's not, uh, it's not an easy circumstance, you know? Sure. But uh, we chose to pay back all of the Bitcoin that people uh, had with us because our customers are what makes our business. This is the core of our business without without the customers there is no nice ash you know <laughs> yeah it's so a very customer centric approach that you had like paying off uh from your profit i mean the, how exactly. did you uh, like what, what what was the decision like was it swift was it uh gradual like did you guys panic at first and what what, what was it like i mean at first it was uh, of course the, the huge question like what to do now and the first thing we did was to completely restructure the company. And basically we built it from scratch. Uh, we took everything apart. Uh, we actually worked with some of the top security experts in the world. Uh, one of the companies, which I cannot name, but they are very high profile and work with some very sensitive uh, clients. And from this point on, we restructured the, um, the entire company and took down everything from the way we store the currencies to how we hire people, how we train staff, how we educate our users, make sure that they have 2FA on their accounts, make sure they get email notifications for any activity, um, as well as, of course, uh, monitoring very closely um, our business side. Um, we also have a strong focus on making sure that customers are safe as well. We can we can quite confidently say now we are, we flip things over on its head. We've gone from, from a, a very small business to a much larger one. And definitely mm -hmm. one of the most safe in the world now. True that, it, and it reflects through your commitment. Uh, but you know, traditional thoughts about crypto, though in general, have been quite conservative. You know, from Warren Buffett's comment to Microsoft in particular. Again, this is something that you even mentioned in your blog post. Uh, they're trying to shut down mining softwares and you're trying to get an online petition signed. Are you ready to battle these big names? No, absolutely. <laughs> How <Yes>. though? <laughs> because I mean, Microsoft, I mean, it's, it's literally Microsoft. And but by the way, the question is in that. The question is, do you think these quote unquote centralized industries are trying to uh either put a cap on you or try to bully you do you think it's a it's a bullying move from them i think it's a combination of things i mean a lot of the traditional minded investors they they kind of there's, there's basically two reasons why they are kind of against the crypto the first one is perhaps misunderstanding it's not really understanding its use cases and so therefore they are very cautious of, of what it is I don't think anyone expected 10 years ago that crypto would, would boom like it is today. It's a lot of a lot of people were not expecting it. 
Mm-hmm. And I think the second reason is is perhaps fear uh, that it's something decentralized, it's something that no one person can control. So if you are a company like uh, Microsoft, we are used to having dominance over the computer market. A new technology that comes out that's completely decentralized um, and in the hands of everyone is is quite a threat to them, I believe. Uh, because you could say something similar towards the traditional banking industry as well. Uh, we see a lot of banks moving towards uh, CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. And this is a, a sort of an attempt, a little bit too late, I think, in, in my opinion, to um, to try to incorporate this software and sorry, to incorporate this new technology into the current economic system. Hmm. But the purpose of Bitcoin and decentralized currencies is uh, is to be decentralized. So having a central bank currency does not really change much in terms of the the current economic model, since the, the banks would still control it. Uh, they still control who can use it, who can open an account with it, who can trade with it. Whereas Bitcoin is the opposite. It's open for everyone. Everyone across the world can have access to it. And you can, you know, you can have access to wealth no matter where you are, no matter what your situation in the world. You know what they say as eloquently as possible, ideas are indeed bulletproof. And, uh, you know, companies are, uh, you know, crypto companies are trying to prove it right. Uh, but it is, it is, it is kind of cool that, you know, you're, you're sort of sticking up to the man, you're, you're trying to, uh, sign a petition. And, uh, you know, we also, uh, I guess, uh, would like to support you on that. But, uh, I mean, let, let's, let's talk about the algorithm though. Okay. Mining in general is all about the point of work, uh, based algorithm, right? But protocols are now shifting towards POS, right? How do you see these shifts? Do you, you know, the, the ultimate question, mining versus stocking? Yeah, this is, a very, <clears throat> this is a very interesting question. And it's one that's you know, the subject to a huge amount of debate uh, within the crypto, both within the crypto community and outside of it. Um, but let's just compare the two first. So proof of work is the sort of original cryptocurrency and this was originally set set up uh, long before that as a, a way to prevent email spam and DDoS attacks back in the 90s. Okay. And later, Satoshi Nakamoto, or whoever the creator of Bitcoin is, then the implemented man this. himself. Yeah, implemented this into a, a currency. So the idea is that with, with proof of work, you have to perform some computational resources in order to validate transactions. So transactions get bundled together into a block. Miners then validate those transactions by solving a mathematical puzzle. Um, I'll not go into details on it because it's quite yeah. complex. Um, but this requires a lot of uh, computer resources and energy. And once the, the first miner to solve the block, they then get rewarded with some of the coin. And then the transactions, they're stored in the public blockchain. So this is a very solid way to um, prevent any form of double spending or that a tr- transaction can be falsified. So it's, uh, it's a very solid way of, of proving the transactions. Whereas proof of stake, this is quite different in the sense that the end goal is the same, but the route is, is different. So this relies, instead of uh, relying on computational power, this relies on uh, the participants having the ownership of the coin supply. So it's a quite different approach. So they're, they're called validators rather than miners in general for most proof of stake uh, formats. And they, they validate the blocks by in proportion to the amount that they stake. So proof of stake has to be very carefully implemented in terms of its algorithm. It really has to be bulletproof since uh, there's a risk that someone who has a lot of the coin, they would have more influence over the, the transactions, which would go against the ethos of the cryptocurrency. So a lot of coins like um, you know, Ethereum or uh, Cardano, uh, coins like this, they are very, very carefully thought about algorithms to solve this problem by implementing penalties or, or other forms to prevent uh, centralization happen- happening. Uh, it's still undergo- undergoing quite a lot of work. And we've seen with Ethereum, it's quite a, quite a tricky process to tra- transform from proof of work to proof of stake. It's not something you can easily do 
overnight. It's it's quite a long term process. True that, but make- it also like Ethereum is so dynamic though that it's so ever changing that I mean uh, stuff something like that might might happen like swiftly, right? Well, do you do you put a exactly. like a timeline on that? Is it is it is it is it something that we're gonna witness in the near future or like later? There's a lot of talk about Ethereum going quite quickly with this, but I think in general, um, proof of work is going to be around for a long time, simply because it's it's one of those things that was the first way to do it, the first main way to do it, hmm. and it's still one of the best ways to do it. So it's it's you can compare it a little bit to the um, TCP IP if you like. It's there are so many things built upon it. Um, it's maybe not the most efficient, but there's so many things built upon it that it's going to be around for, for quite some time. Fair enough. Let, let's talk coins though. All right. I mean, if you even do basic research, people people consider Raven coin uh, to be the most profitable out of the lot. When at the mining perspective, uh, keep in mind that you have your own exchange. Uh, what coin do you think has the most potential mining wise? Uh, also, you incorporated a Doge coin recently. Again, we saw that in your blog post. Uh, so drop in value seems not to be, uh, you know, not to bother people nowadays, I suppose. Do, do, you, do you agree with that hypothesis or what? Yeah, I think, uh, well, with Dogecoin, for example, we don't actually support the mining of it. It's uh, just listed on the exchange. But I think crypto is much more mature now in the sense that people know it goes up and down a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you hold on to your coins, you're, you'll probably get something back if you're in the right place. Um, in regards to the, the mining coins, yeah, Ravencoin is one that's just very popular. Um, Ethereum is probably the most profitable at the moment. Hmm. Um, but Ravencoin has a lot of potential. It's been around for quite a while. Hmm. It's got a team of developers. Um, they make a lot of upgrades to the algorithms. Um, so it has potential. But I think there are some newer ones which which perhaps have even more potential. You have hmm. things like Flux, Octopus Protocol, hmm. and Ergo, uh, which will be very soon supported on, on NiceHash. All right. All right. And, and you, you seem to be open towards like uh, having more coins being available on your platform, right? Even the new ones. Absolutely. Yeah. We aim to, to include as much support as possible. Uh, the goal of NASH, again, as mentioned, is to make it as easy as possible for people to get into crypto and for miners to easily exchange from, from coin to coin. So we, we add new coins every month. Hmm. You, you 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 go you guys are, I'm, 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 people are st- st- still a little bit confused about where do you stand uh, in terms of your mining service like you guys are you guys all about uh, pool mining or is it more of a cloud mining thing what, what what's how do you guys uh, offer your service exactly yeah, we, we get this question a lot <laughs> people often think that we are a mining pool um, but actually, we're not. Uh, nice actually is a hash power broker. So what this okay. means is people can can buy and sell computing power, hash power. So and it's in an open marketplace. Okay. So we are not a centralized mining pool. We are not a centralized business in this sense. We are simply a connection between miners and sellers. So we're not a mining pool. We don't mine coins directly ourselves. We just simply provide the computer power to other people to be able to mine. Okay. And the users, uh, another common question we get as well, actually, is that, that users think that they're mining directly a coin when they sign up. This is not the case since it's the buyers of the hash power which are deciding what to mine, which algorithm to mine. They're simply using the computer power from the users towards their mining efforts. So these are often pools which are using us. Uh, but do you have any message for the solo miners out there? Imagine a guy sitting somewhere trying to figure out his best rig and uh, making pro- it's all by himself. Uh, he against the rest of the world. What, what message you guys what, what would you have for them? Come, come join us, maybe? I would, yeah, it depends on the amount of resources you want to put into it. And I would say for anyone who wants to, to do solo mining, and especially if you're, if you're a gamer, for example, and you have a PC, you want to give mining a go, you've got a few GPU cards, hmm. or maybe you want to invest in a small rig, 
I would say get started with NiceHash because you have more chance to have a stable income from it. And when you when you set out mining uh, by yourself, it requires quite a bit of knowledge, quite a bit of uh, hardware, and quite a bit of research to know mm. which coins to do. Mm. Whereas with NiceHash, you get paid for every share that you are that mm. your computer is used for mining, so mm. you'll get paid regardless of, of what happens. So I would say it's a good way to get started, to get into to mining, to understand how it works. And mm. if you just want a stable income, then give my size a try. There you go. There is the plug. <laughs> now, on your website, you have a section where you can uh, calculate their, but uh, one can calculate their ROI on you know their CPU or GPU uh, you know based on mining uh, thing, like what kind of a mining rig do you suggest works the best though? Like people are going for a hybrid like A6 CPU GPU combination. What do you, what what do you think works the best? Yeah, we have this uh, section on the website where you can calculate. This is basically based on all the past data that we have, and. Of course, we, we cannot predict the future, but it gives you a pretty accurate idea of what you can expect. Hmm. And it's very useful for people who are getting started with mining, uh, who want to know what their hardware can do, or also for people who want to buy new hardware and estimate what they could get from that from that new hardware. Uh -huh. In terms of a, a mining rig, uh, GPUs is really the only way to go at the moment, uh, since they're more versatile and you can easily switch algorithms with them. You can also use them for gaming. You can also resell the hardware later. So it's mm. much more flexible in this sense. If you're using something like a, an ASIC, it's a specific to the algorithm. So if that coin goes bust or something goes wrong. Quite exp expensive you're, you're as well. Hunk of metal, you know? <laughs> yeah. There's so much more you can do with that. But your your because you're you're so different though, uh so you your your service, like somebody who wants to start with mining right away and he has uh, not so much of an optimized rig, he can get started with nice hash as well, correct? Exactly, yeah. You can you can very easily hmm. just download the software in about five clicks. You can have it up and running in less than five minutes. So you, you're saying it's easy on the pocket? It's easy on the pocket and easy on the uh, effort as well. It's a very simple way to get started. You don't need... To buy any software, but but, but no no cap no cap on the profits. Or do you have like this is the amount of money you could only make over here? Do you have a <laughs> cap on that? No, it's uh, it's entirely up to the the marketplace. That is okay. That is a smart way to answer that. Okay, now in in April two thousand and twenty one, hashing power hit more than one hundred and ninety eight quintillion hashes per second a record of its kind uh, you know higher hash rate suggests uh you know uh, a healthy crypto economy right but it also means bitcoin prices will rise now how does it feel in the pandemic era the industry is actually thriving I mean, it, it seemed like there's like many industry trying to get shut down, but this is something that is like, like the ed tech wave also started with the pandemic era, like nothing before crypto people seem to underestimate it because maybe it's not that visible to the, like the people, the non-investors and all of that, the skeptics, but it is booming. How, like, how do you think that's happening? How do you analyze it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you say, a high, higher hash rate means better security and a healthier economy. So yeah, crypto is definitely booming and thriving on, on many fronts. And it's a, it's very exciting because it draws so many more people into it. Uh, there's so, so much more media attention from it. And this gets, you know, the more people are interested, the more talent uh -huh. becomes interested. And then the, the more the whole thing just spirals and, and develops. So it's a very, very exciting time. And I said 2020 and 2021, I've also seen like huge increase in hedge funds or big mainstream investors getting into cryptocurrency. I think that's a real sign that the industry is, is, is starting to take off. You could, you could put it as the, the end of the beginning, if you like. <laughs> it's, um, the first stage is, is just getting started to the next phase. You could almost mm. compare Bitcoin to, uh, to the first airplane. You know, it flew. Okay. But 
it's not comparable to what we have today when you can fly a jum jumbo jet. But that first movement was what triggered this, you know, the whole wave of development into this new technology. So I think it's a very, very exciting time. Let's talk about another parallel wave that's going on with the crypto world. It's called the EdTech wave. Everybody seems to be a guru now. Everybody is now coming up with the next EdTech thing. Uh, since we are, you know, quite, you know, we are literally based on technology more than any other industry possible. Do you think it's the right time to approach those skeptics, those non-investors and trying to make them aware? Uh, are you are you open because you have you, you are you open towards uh, opening an academy? Maybe do you think that's a good thing to start? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's the duty of the whole like, crypto community to educate more people into it. There's plenty of, you know, at the beginning, it was just, you know, some guys with computers that figured out how to do something and it stayed like that for quite some time. But now it's it's gone so mainstream that it's our, it's our duty to educate people. It's really important that people understand it. Uh, we see a lot of um, articles in the mainstream news of things related to crypto, which are just plain wrong because they, they don't have the, the knowledge. And that's really important for us to, um, to, to educate the users. At NiceDash, we have um, a very large blog page and help articles where we develop uh, education for users so people can understand all the aspects because there, there are many aspects to it. And uh, very soon we're uh, launching a, a YouTube channel with much more educational content. So this will be many things like blog blockchain basics, mm. uh, how to get started in mining, what is mining, with much more explanations on, on what actually goes on behind the scenes. You know what they say, right? Maybe the next Steve Jobs will come out of the crypto industry. Who knows? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but what about, what about another thing? What about your own token? A lot of people seem to do that as well. Uh, you, you're, you, are you willing to come up with your own coin, maybe link it to your uh, mining service or your exchange? And wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, yeah, okay, it would be cool. I mean, it's something we've discussed in the past, but it's not it's not something that we see worthwhile and because it doesn't bring a huge amount of benefit to our users. Okay. Uh, you To make it successful, to make a really good coin or token, you need a full team of developers just working on that. Whereas we prefer to focus our efforts on making mining easier, making it safer and easier for people to get into and okay. growing our exchange and working on other new products that we have in the pipeline. All right, uh, Mr. Downey, uh, what is the one thing you wish every person knew about your company? Great question. I think there are almost two things. So the first one is that we are, we're not a mining pool. But the second thing would be that we are actually a real uh, legitimate company based and regulated in Europe. We get a lot of comments of people imagining we are based in some shed somewhere in, in Russia, but we're actually a real European company who is who is here with, with real people. And we have a, a human support team. So there's, there's always a human contact with us. Fantastic. Hey, all right, Mr. Downey, uh, let me ask you this simple question, all right? Bitcoin mining, go or no go? Okay, waste of energy or is it something that's actually efficient? I think in reality, Bitcoin mining is blown out of proportion uh, by the media in terms of its energy use. And it's actually a very efficient use of power. If you compare it to another industry like the automobile industry, you mm -hmm. take uh, metal, rubber, plastic, glass, all these components to make a car, which also requires electricity. And you make a car, you, you launch it to the public, and straight away it drops in value, it devalues. And you're never going to get that same amount back. Whereas with Bitcoin, you take the electricity, a few computer components, and it's turned into something that's grown exponentially in value. It's available to anyone around the world and as a global payment system without the need for banks. So in my opinion, this is a very efficient use of the energy. I mean, that's physics 101. You can neither create or destroy energy. You can only transform it. So maybe this it, is yeah. the most <laughs> transformative way of value. So go Bitcoin uh, mining, a go. Thumbs up. Thumbs up to that. All right. Absolutely. Mr. Downey, uh, 
proof of work mining relies on a decentralized network to secure the network. But this uh, leaves an attack surface known as the 51% attack, quite infamous. Uh, what what does nice hash do to tackle this in the in the in the blockchain perspective? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. But um, nice hash because we provide very large amounts of hash power to the marketplace. We actually support many uh, small blockchain projects and startups to get going um, because they can rent hash power from us in order to secure their networks until they are decentralized enough to become secure. And it's also something um, that if a project is, is under an attack, they can also rent our hash power as a way to prevent it and secure their network. But we are sometimes accused of the, the opposite, that people could buy hash power to then attack a network. But it's much more often the, the opposite case where we're actually preventing attacks and helping others to secure their networks. Hmm. It's actually impossible for us to know how the hash power is used in, in a way. We are more like um, an ISP, you know, an internet provider. Mm -hmm. We provide the internet, but we, you, the ISP doesn't have control over what you are doing with that. You simply provide that internet to, to the users. And it's quite similar with Nash. You can, you can use this to, to support your network as well. Tony. Cryptocurrency mining also drew cyber criminal attention. That's the hypothesis. What's your stance on that? I think this is, again, something similar to the energy use. So it's a little bit blown out of proportion uh, in the media. There's far more laundering going on with cash than there is with cryptocurrencies. That's for sure. I think in the beginning, cryptocurrencies were not very well heard of, not very well known of. So it was quite easy for criminals to use this as an easy way to, to move money. But blockchain technology is public. It's open. So anyone can view it. And there are now hundreds of tracking tools where you can see exactly where money was sent from to who. And it's actually very, very difficult to launder money on Bitcoin unless you really put a lot of effort into it because it's all open and can be traced. I think what we're seeing in, in terms of ransomware and, and this becoming a problem, that's, that's more related to where these hackers are based than the actual technology since they are harbored by North Korea or Russia or places like this, which, which don't do much to, to stop their, their criminals from, from using this as a, as a means. Whereas the actual cryptocurrency in general is not, it's not something that's very good for criminal use, to be honest. True that, true that. And you have personal experience with that sort of stuff with your company as well, and you handled it quite professionally. I mean, final question, question, Mr. Downey, you do not, uh, you're not sort of a traditional like mining pool service, like we got that out of the way. So you, you approach things differently and you, you, people are actually happy. You have 600,000 plus, correct me if I'm wrong, daily active workers. Uh, you have 250,000 plus, 250, plus daily active knife hash miners. I mean, these are good numbers, right? A lot of people trust you, but there are also a lot of skeptics, specifically in the mining uh, thing, because a lot of, you know, it's not exactly pocket friendly. Not everybody can do that. Uh, but I know the overall feel of it, though, mining is thriving. Like crypto is thriving, as I mentioned before as well, right? Uh, but the fluctuations also thriving. The the the, the price, you know, the, the, it's it's insane, right? Do you think crypto mining is sustainable with the you know the drop in value and the fluctuations and all of that? Do you do you think it's sustainable as in as in something? Do do you think it will go mainstream, like trading maybe? Yeah, I think we we're already starting to see it go mainstream. I mean, nice actually hit a million miners uh, back in May. We have over 800,000 every day. So it's, we, we're also seeing a big jump in the number of uh, personal computers, like gaming computers, uh, using it, which is a clear sign that more people are interested to just give it a go and try it and, and see what happens. So I think that's, uh, that's a, a clear sign that mining is thriving and that it's developing and more people are curious about it. More people are interested to, to give it a try. I mean, who doesn't want to make some money from just uh, turning on your PC and leaving it running. <laughs>
Well, uh, continuing you know, from that, who doesn't want to make money? Ladies and gentlemen, that's the cardinal rule. Everybody wants to make money. So do you. So go to nicehash.com. Check out what they're all about. Uh, and Mr. Downey, I believe you're also, uh, you have your own Telegram uh, uh, channel or you're, you, do, do you, are you active on YouTube and other social media platforms personally uh, as well? Or do you yeah. think the, uh, and how active is the uh, company and social media? Yeah, so nice hash. We're on uh, Reddit is our biggest one. Okay. Uh, we Reddit. have over 100,000 users there. And then we've got yeah. Discord. Okay, and Discord. Facebook and Twitter as well. These are our main platforms. So go ahead, guys, and uh, check them out. <laughs>